Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, FY 2023 Office of Justice Programs Community-Based Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, hosted by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Browning, Senior Policy Advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance for some welcome remarks and to begin the presentation. Kathy. Thank you, Daryl, and good afternoon, everyone. As Daryl said, my name is Kathy Browning, and I'm, I work at BJA. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this webinar for the uh, FY23 OJP Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative solicitation. If you have a copy of the solicitation handy, you might want to pull it out to take notes. Can we go to the next slide? Today, I'm joined by a number of my OJP colleagues who are collaborating with BJA on this initiative, as well as on the solicitation. You'll get a chance to hear from each of them today. Go to the next slide. However, one of my colleagues, Eddie Bocanegra, Senior Advisor in the Office of the Assistant Attorney General, is not able to join us live today. So he recorded a message for you all. Daryl, can you play this? Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude for all those who are listening in and for all those that day in and day out are trying to make our communities healthier, vibrant, and safe through healing, collaboration, and hard work. We see you. Today's webinar is in our 2023 CVI PI solicitation. And here at OJP, we have been excited about this next wave of funding for a million reasons, with the most important one being helping to reduce incidents of violence in our community. Our first rotation last year resulted in funding for 47 site-based awards, three intermediary groups providing funding and TTA to smaller local CVI programs, and three TTA awards. Funded in part through the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, these marked a historic investment in community violence intervention programs from the Department of Justice. This issue, continues to be a key priority of the department. This past February, we held our first conference for CVI PI grantees, where current, previous, and subject experts were invited to attend the conference in our efforts to join you in continuing to build a community of healers. The energy of the conference was inspiring as it was an opportunity for people who have been doing this work for so long to come together, to learn from each other, and to motivate one another. It also provided an opportunity for our guests and the field to hear directly from key leadership that included Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Sullivan, Associate Attorney General Benita Gupta, and the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. The overall message, CVI is a priority. The work that you do is important. This year, we're excited to have another $100 million for CVI PI awards. You'll notice we added a new category for state this year. As we know, they play an important part in building CVI infrastructure and supporting CVI strategies. We have also taken proactive steps to increase the pool of peer reviewers, particularly for those who have much better understanding of these issues. We have visited several CVI programs and engaged other stakeholders who might not have had access to DOJ. We did a five-part webinar series on the various elements of CVI to help inform current and future grantees, including having other federal partners discussing their resources to support CVI PI programs. In addition to CVI PI, the department is prioritizing CVI PI strategies under other funding opportunities, including BGA smart policing initiatives and the Burn JAG program. These are just some examples, and we know there's still work to do. Lastly, on April 7th, we'll be hosting our second webinar on OJP's Capacity Building Series. We provide strategies and information to assist applicants like you on how to best leverage your community expertise to receive priority consideration. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Can we go to the next slide? Hi, so I'd like to start with a very brief guide to what OJP looks like for some of you might be new to uh, this 
this office and a little bit about what the alphabet soup stands for. So OJP provides grant funding, training, research, and statistics to the criminal justice community. Um, you'll see underneath there, there are six different uh, components of OJP, um, as the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Bureau of Justice Statistics, National Institute of Justice, Office of Convictions of Crime, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and the SMART Office. All right, next slide. Now I'm gonna dive into the solicitation. The CBI initiative provides funding to reduce violent crime by supporting comprehensive violent, violence intervention and prevention programs that involve partnerships between residents, local government, victim service providers, community-based organizations or CBOs, researchers, and other community stakeholders. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, this initiative is a collaboration of several of the components of OJP, including BJA, OJJDP, OBC, and NIJ, all of whom are participating in this uh, webinar. And the involvement of all of these individuals allows us to ensure that we're including um, a focus on victims and juvenile justice system issues, as well as supporting important research on effective practices. So there are four principles that guide us in this work. First, we're focusing on targeted interventions that support the highest need groups and the highest risk group, as opposed to just to the at-risk groups more generally. Uh, these uh, approaches are community-centered and equity-focused. Involvement of the community that is being served is critical in this work. Uh, integration with public safety and public health. This is a multidisciplinary um, approach to uh, violence reduction, and it reaches across a range of services, including uh, um, law enforcement, as well as public health um, agencies. It's also strategic and data-driven. So we encourage, uh, as part of uh, these projects, to, um, to do strategic planning, to identify the CBI approaches that are the best fit for your community, and partnerships with researchers to help determine what's working and what needs to be changed or modified. Next slide. All right, as Eddie mentioned, uh, there has, have been a couple of changes to the solicitation. So for those of you who are familiar with last year's solicitation, um, pay close attention here because it's a little bit different. Um, we have reduced the number of categories, plus we've added a new one. So you'll see uh, category one this year is uh, for um, community-based and tribal organizations. So these are for awards up to $2 million each. Um, the second category will focus on applicants from city and county and tribal government. So hopefully all of these have partnerships across the range, but this is who the applicant um, is. For category three, uh, this is the new category uh, for, for state government. So we're looking for a state government application. Um, and these uh, will be up to $4 million each. And then the fourth category is for capacity building, where we will be funding intermediary organizations to make uh, smaller awards to local agencies that often aren't able to get federal funds or, um, you know, ha or haven't had access to them. Um, these are up for up to $4 million each. Now, one thing I did want to just point out is that as we say in here, up to 2 million, up to 4 million, we know that, you know, some areas might be smaller and not need all of this money. We ask that you um, apply for what you need within that uh, flame framework there. Um, so, uh, just, so just a little uh, tip up front on that. 
So this time I'm going to turn it over to my colleague at BJA, Tenzing Laden. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I am Tenzin Laden, Senior Policy Advisor with BJA, and I'm going to be focusing on Category 1 and 2, and we are really looking, we are really looking for applications that plan to develop, implement, expand, or enhance comprehensive strategies in their community. Uh, category 1 focuses on community-based organizations or travel organizations, and Category 2 uh, focuses on city, county, and tribal government. And with any community-based or community-led effort, you can be at any stage of readiness for implementation. You can be at a planning or implementation stage, or you could be really further along in your approach towards the community violence intervention strategy. We want to meet you where you are, recognize and lift your work, and provide resources to support implementation, expansion, or enhance enhancing the reach of your existing services. So multidisciplinary team plays an important role in approaching the issue in a comprehensive manner with individualized feedback from different stakeholders. Stakeholders reflect the needs and resources of the community in which it is developed. So you might already have a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders in place, or maybe you want to review and assess your current stakeholders or maybe you want to expand uh, the team or create a new formal working group, committee, or collaboration. So please make sure that your project design proposes to undertake the work through a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders. Next slide, please. So some examples of stakeholders on the team may include, but are not limited to CVI service providers, county, local, public sector leadership, community-based organizations, uh, court personnel, and there are a lot of examples that are listed on your screen. So I would say like the multidisciplinary team should plan to meet regularly throughout the project period to guide and inform the planning and implementation processes. So please make sure to include a separate attachment titled CBI team, which includes the list of your multidisciplinary team members and name of their agency. And if you already have uh, a memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreements with stakeholders, feel free to include them as an attachment to your application. Uh, also, please plan to incorporate voices of survivors uh, of community violence in your proposed approach. Next slide, please. One of the things uh, uh, that I think is really important to note is that CBI, uh, that the proposed CBI program is grounded in an understanding of what is driving the violence in the community, and uh, they should be informed by data and community input as well as feedback from uh, those who have experienced the violence or are at risk of violence. Hence, a successful applicant or an award recipient will engage in an initial planning process uh, of up to nine months by engaging stakeholders, including researchers, to use the data and the information to design and define approaches to addressing community violence that are based uh, on evidence or test a theory of change. Uh, the multidisciplinary stakeholder team will develop and enhance a community-specific uh, comprehensive violence uh, reduction strategic plan that is informed by local data and, you know, you might have an existing strategic plan, so you can review that too. So we do encourage you, and by that I mean require you to collaborate with research partners to assist with conducting a community violence assessment to determine where and why the violence is occurring and to assess current gaps and barriers that may exist. Uh, it is ex uh, expected that a research partner will be an active member of the working group and employ an action research method to implement the program and its strategies, uh, identify and suggest evidence-based strategies that is tailored to the community and uh, leading the identification and collection of key performance matrix to include ongoing process and outcome assessment. So if you do not uh, submit that uh, completed documentation, such as letter of commitment, 
memorandum of understanding that demonstrates the structure and the partners um, to the community collaboration piece, as well as any, you know, who will be responsible for implementing uh, uh, what aspect of the project design, you will be required to submit that within the six months of the award. So before we move to the next slide, there is a BJA CBI uh, implementation checklist. It is referenced in the solicitation. It is a good resource to inform planning and implementation of your program. Next slide, please. So award recipients in the category one and two will be expected to work uh, with and receive training and technical assistance from OGP funded TTA provider. Our current TTA provider, community-based public safety collective will be working directly with funded project sites, and we also have two other TTA providers, LISC and Hotline Alliance, that they will be, uh, they will provide uh, CBI TTA resources and support the field. Um, as for evaluation, we strongly encourage applicants uh, to participate in a rigorous evaluation of their CBI strategies. We encourage applicants to applying under categories one and two to also participate in NIJ evaluation piece. And Jen uh, from NIJ, she will be talking about that towards the end of this session. It is important that you think about that piece for category one and two, as OJP will prioritize funding applications that also submit a paired proposal in response to the NIJ solicitation. So if you are planning to submit an application that is paired proposal, and in, uh, with NIJ solicitation, please clearly state, uh, indicate that in the proposal abstract and provide the name of the uh, of your research partner uh, that you will be working with. If the same entity or individual is to carry out the roles of research partner and evaluator and uh, under the NIJ solicitation, then you must budget separately for the roles and respective application and clearly describe the methods for distinguishing these roles and maintaining objectivity and independence in the evaluation process. Next slide, please. So page two and three of the solicitation includes eligibility criteria for category one, the focus is on community-based and our travel organization. So eligibility is limited to nonprofits, for-profit, uh, Native American and Alaskan Native travel organization. And this is a tip for any solicitation, eligibility is the first thing that you wanna check because it, we would hate for you to have put a lot of effort into an application uh, only to find out that you are not eligible uh, to apply for the solicitation. So really encourage you to, you know, for any, any kind of solicitation to look at the eligibility requirement first. Next slide, please. Uh, category two is geared towards uh, city, county, travel, government, and these are limited to the following type of organization, city, town, township government, county government, Native American, Alaskan Native tribal governments, Alaskan Native Claims Development Act, regional cooperations, special district governments, public housing authorities, Indian housing authorities, and independent school district. Next slide, please. So deliverables uh, for category one and two are listed on page 18 of the solicitation. You will need to submit a full list of active working group members, as well as letter of commitment or MOU, uh, and should be submitted within the first six months of the date of the award. You will also be required to develop or enhance existing community specific violence re reduction st uh, strategic plan that informed by available data, existing plans that could be used as a guide uh, for the project. Real participation and effort to assess, evaluate, and translate learning from the program to the field to advance the knowledge and support peer learning. Examples include participation and presentation at actual conference, could be web-based presentation, partnership engagement, or uh, you know, podcasts. So these are something that, uh, you know, these can be something that is organized by OJP funded training and technical assistance provider or OJP. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a sense of the type 
of interfaces that we may ask successful applicants to engage in as we help promote the strategies and opportunities to address community violence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, documentation for a particular strategy, strategy that is data-driven, evidence-informed, community-led, and trauma-informed. These four are fundamental to success and are embellished, uh, probably not saying it correctly, uh, of a true CDI strategy. And so the final report summarizing the activities of the program, including successes, lesson learned, and future plans are due within 90 days of the program uh, end date. And if you have a research partner that is expected, uh, it's expected that their programmatic process and outcomes finding uh, be integrated into the final report. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Sharon at OVC. She will be covering category three and four. Okay. Thank you, Tenzing. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or hello, because I know some people might be earlier in the day, so it's great to see everybody. So as Tenzing mentioned, um, I'm Sharon Fletcher. I'm in the Office for Victims of Crime, and I'm going to take a few moments to go over our Category 3 and 4 um, uh, solicitation categories today. Um, and I want to make sure that um, we understand that these Category 3 and 4 are both um, going to be still focused in highlighting those um, solicitation priorities that were outlined earlier in the presentation around targeting violence interventions and supports for highest need groups, um, having a community-centered and equity-focused um, approach, um, as well as integration with public safety and public health. Um, and also um, funding and looking for strategic, data-driven, and performance-focused uh, strategies. So starting with Category 3, CVIP for state government, uh, this category will support state government agencies and coordinate and support local level CVI strategies through sub-awards across multiple communities in one or more jurisdictions within their state. So this category is really going to be looking for applications that are focused on statewide approaches to providing some sub-awards that will then support CVI approaches at the local level. So they're going to be um, passing that money through, essentially. Um, so these applications may propose uh, to either, one, develop and implement new state-level strategies for, to support CVI implementation at the local level, or they can expand in, or enhance the reach of their existing state-level strategies to support CVI implementation at the local level. So I know I've heard there are several states that are doing um, statewide approaches to uh, credible methods and street outreach approaches, as well as some states that have provided funding to do statewide projects that are supporting hospital-based approaches. So there's, you know, we know there's some existing strategies that are being used there. So this is the space where we will be able to either, again, develop some new statewide strategies or, um, or um, enhance those existing strategies that we, that you know are working um, in your community. So applicants in Category 3 should propose, of course, a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders, as was mentioned previously. So those stakeholders could be, you know, unique to your state and come from a variety of areas. So that would include your CVI service providers, county and local um, leadership, um, community-based organizations, uh, juvenile justice professionals, law enforcement, of course, victim advocates and service providers, um, mental health services, or your local researchers and other school administrators, but just an array of partners that we know are supporting your efforts uh, on the ground. Um, and so, again, this is another category that is asking that applicants include an attachment that's labeled CVIPI team that lists team participants' names as well as the names of their agencies. Um, applicants should also describe the process that their state uh, we'll choose those local and select those local level programs that will receive the sub awards. Um, and that process should include a timeline, funding ranges for the sub awards, and a process, of course, for monitoring those sub awards after they're made. Um, awarded recipients, um, as was mentioned previously for the other categories, these award recipients will also be able to access the TTA from the OJP funded TTA providers um, with LISC 
Heartland Alliance and the collective, and they'll be able to um, access that TTA provider for their subrecipients as well as their overall project. Um, your uh, application should also discuss your plans for identifying TTA needs of the programs that are funded via subawards, and that plan should in indicate any uh, other resources that you plan to dedicate to support those projects. Uh, next slide, please. So because Category 3 has a very simple eligibility, um, it's our state government agency since we are focused specifically on statewide efforts. Um, so again, state government agencies are those that are eligible and for Category 3. Next slide, please. So just to walk through the deliverables, um, if anyone is following along on in the solicitation, this, I believe this starts at the bottom of page 17. Deliverables for Category 3 include um, developing and implementing that process for assessing and addressing gaps in local government and CBO's capacity to implement CVI projects. So um, as was mentioned previously, again, we are really trying to list up strategies that are using um, some uh, assessments to provide indicators of what's driving the violence in, in the state, as well as assessment of existing efforts and gaps in resources to meet those needs. Um, as well as engaging in strategic planning to identify community safety priorities. And the focus of both of these efforts are, of course, to make sure that we are being thoughtful and what approaches we are putting together to address the violence in our communities and drive that down. And using that data-driven approach um, to make sure we are being effective in our response to violence. Um, other deliverables for Category 3 include supporting the local implementation of those CVI strategies through the sub-awards. Um, and, and of course, there's a requirement that um, you submit a final report, and the elements of those reports, of course, would include a clear summary description of the strategies that were implemented and supported by those subrecipients. And um, I should mention that those subrecipients, of course, will be required to submit to uh, those uh, intermediary agencies, the state government agencies, final reports as well. So a lot of this information will be gleaned from the subrecipients um, final reports and then reported up uh, to uh, OJP. Um, but that final report will also cover an assessment of the programmatic violence reduction or capacity enhancement outcomes. It should identify promising practices. Uh, it should also um, identify common themes that emerge from across those CVI strategies funded in the sub-awards. Um, and a key point, of course, is sharing out those lessons learned and, very importantly, uh, those challenges encountered so that we can uh, learn from those in future iterations, as well as recommendations for future CVI program development. Next slide, please. So our Category 4. Um, is CVI capacity building category. So this um, category is similar to the state space, in, um, but it's, it's instead is targeting organizations um, that are serving as fiscal agents that will then provide those sub awards. So through this category, OJP is looking for to identify at least five intermediary organizations that will serve as fiscal agents that will then um, identify and provide TTA oversight and sub awards to up to five community-based organizations or CBOs over the course of the project period. So those intermediary organizations, again, not state level, but um, state government agencies, but they should be national, regional, or more localized organizations that have established capacity to work with CBOs, um, and particularly those focused on underserved communities. Um, and so we're open to a range of models that can be used by these intermediary organizations serving as fiscal agents. Um, they could be CBO focused in a particular city region or have a broader national scope. And the approaches the that see that are, my audio still working? Yes, sorry about that, Sharon. That, that issue has okay. been taken care of. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if that was me or something else. All right, sorry guys. But moving on, um, so the approaches that um, are put in place by these intermediary, intermediary organizations uh, to uh, fund the subawards should seek to build capacities that can be sustained by the local or regional partners at the end of the project. So we do anticipate that the intermediary organizations will competitively award those subawards in collaboration, of course, with OJP, as well as provide TTA to support the selected CBOs implementing uh, the new CVI programs and existing programs. 
subawards are expected to range between $100,000 and $250,000. Um, and again, we do anticipate that the CBOs will using this fund to increase their capacity to um, and, and, and workforce development and support of CBI intervention. So there's a, a range of methods that might go into doing that. So that would include um, offering support through these subawards to CBOs that may cover salary support, um, salary support, equipment, materials, training opportunities and travel costs associated with training and technical assistance. Um, funds can also be used to develop curricula, assessment tools, or organizational policies and procedures such as wellness plans to support your CBI staff because we know that um, this is uh, pretty hard work that we're doing. So we want to make sure that we are being very thoughtful and intentional and creating healthy workplaces um, that have healthy staff to go out and do this hard work. Um, next slide, please. So eligibility for Category 4 um, includes public and state controlled institutions of high education, higher education, as well as private institutions of higher education, nonprofits that um, do or do not have 501c3 status with the IRS, um, and also for-profit organizations, which would also include small businesses. Next slide. So um, our deliverables for Category 4, which I believe are outlined in eight, page 18 of the solicitation. Um, so each of these uh, grantees should be, um, grant grantees applicants should include in your proposals how you address these um, deliverables. And so that will include assessing the gaps in the CBO's capacity to implement CBI projects. And so the CBO's um, reflected in this uh, deliverable are those that will be receiving those subawards. Um, we also anticipate that you'll be able to show us how you plan to develop in collaboration with OJP that solicitation or request for proposals with agreed upon uh, selection criteria to um, identify those subawards. We anticipate that you'll also be able to develop and host, again, in collaboration with OJP, a pre-application solicitation webinar, much like the one we are on right now for potential applicants um, of those subawards. And then we also would like to make sure that you're um, giving us some good information and details on how you're going to conduct the seed that selection process for subawards um, in collaboration with an approval from BJA to identify the sub recipient sites as part of the process. Um, and that process should in ensure that each of the CBOs meet the following criteria. So those CBOs should be able to identify at least one CBI strategy that it should plan to initiate or is already operating in the jurisdiction. It should also clearly identify the resources needed to support that strategy and build their capacity to address their um, violence uh, issues and reduce violence. Um, and then it should also demonstrate their capacity and willingness to work collaboratively with the TTA provider. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the final set of deliverables um, for Category 4 um, are these here are actually reflected, um, reflecting requirements after the subawards are made. So from there, we do anticipate that you'll be able to conduct meetings with subrecipient CBOs on a periodic basis to memorialize the proceedings. Um, and, I'm sorry, and, and memorialize the proceedings with, you know, meeting notes, transcripts, or recordings. So you'll be able to have a note and really keep track and record of what you're doing so that we can uh, mark our progress and learn. We anticipate that you will able to be, that applicants would be able to complete capacity needs assessments for each participating CBO and work with those organizations to prepare some um, capacity development plans. In some spaces, I've heard things refer to this as a TA plan, but really being thoughtful on thinking about the needs of those organizations, how, um, what resources we have to bear to address those needs, and putting together a solid plan on how we are going to address those. Um, and so that capacity development plan is guiding, of course, that TTA provided by the intermediary organization and will be reviewed in, and should be reviewed and updated as necessary during the project period. Um, and then lastly, we do anticipate that they will be conducting some regional and topical meetings across sites um, on common issue areas. And they, these meetings should include subject matter experts and materials from DOJ programs and initiatives, including but not limited to, of course, my office, OVC, 
the um, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our related programs that we're all working with to support violence intervention efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So um, that said, I will move to talk about the priority considerations that are covered for all of our categories. Um, so that's for all four categories um, that these considerations come into play. The first two um, are related to our Executive Order 13985 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. So there are two categories um, where you may claim priority consideration. The first here is um, applications that include projects that will promote racial equity and removal of barriers to access and opportunities for communities that have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by inequality when making award decisions. Um, so to claim this specific priority co um, consideration, we do ask that um, applicants specifically address and, and, and identify that they want to um, expressly uh, claim this priority consideration and have some narrative um, in their program narrative or pro and or program abstract that explains how they support um, this effort and how their projects are promoting, promoting racial equity and removal of barriers to access um, for these communities. The second piece under the um, Executive Order 13985 um, where applicants may uh, claim priority consideration are those applicants are that are able to demonstrate that their capabilities and competencies for implementing their projects are enhanced because they or one of their subrecipients or partners um, are a culturally specific organization that will receive at least 40% of the requested award funding and that is demonstrated in the budget, meaning the budget must clearly show that the organization that claims that that is identifying as a culturally specific organization is receiving 40% of the funding. And again, that one, um, to claim that priority consideration, you must have that clearly identified in your application budget. And again, um, identify that in your program narrative and program abstract. Other areas of priority consideration for all of our categories include application from communities with documented high or increased levels of homicides per capita. And those applicants, again, should include documentation in your proposal narrative to support that. Um, another area of priority consideration are applicants that demonstrate existing partnerships with multidisciplinary team stakeholder members um, through letters of commitment or memorandums of understanding. Um, and those um, applicants will receive priority current consideration and should include those, uh, their letters of uh, commitment or their MOUs as an attachment that is labeled, clearly labeled CVIPI team with the names of the participants on the team and the names of their agencies, as well as um, what those uh, letters of commitment uh, and MOUs uh, might cover as far as program um, uh, any uh, program considerations and uh, collaborations between agencies. Um, and lastly, um, the last priority consideration I'll cover for all categories are applicants that propose a companion evaluation application under our under the NIJ solicitation um, that is also now open uh, for funding and that NIJ solicitation is funding um, evaluation and research activities uh, of our CBIPI projects. So one last note, of course, is that I just want to make clear that even though applicants may address these priority areas, um, those, these priority consideration areas are only one of the many factors that OJP considers when making funding decisions. So receiving your priority consideration from one or more priority areas does not guarantee um, an award. So uh, with that, I will pass it off to my colleague, Scott. Um. Yeah, so as Sharon and uh, Tenzing pointed out, um, you know, the the uh, strategies really may, um, you know, may look very different from one community to another, and frankly, they should based on the need and the resources available. Um, my name is Scott Pestridge. I'm a senior program manager with uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. I'm just going to walk through a couple of things. Um, additional resources are enumerated in the solicitation. Um, they're really called from these um, four principles that, that Kathy talked about earlier around 
targeted intervention supports for the highest need group, community-centered equity focus, integration with public safety, public health, and strategic data-driven and performance focus. These resources are not all-inclusive, but they're emblematic of uh, resources that you may find helpful as you stand up CBI strategies. The probably the most seminal uh, resource listed is this Bureau of Justice Assistance Community Violence Intervention Microsite that has a community CDI checklist, uh, principles, a glossary, strategies, some great resources, uh, webinars, that sort of thing. Um, it's good. It's good information. Should you have the time to dig deep, but I know you're going to be digging pretty deep in terms of responding to this uh, pretty in-depth and a comprehensive uh, solicitation. Um, Crime Solutions is another great resource that uses rigorous research to inform practitioners and policymakers. Um, you might want to look at that. A BCJI program um, focuses on data-driven, comprehensive, community-led strategies. There's a, a great link there. Next slide. I'm just trying to be mindful of time. Um, Youth.gov is a great overarching um, uh, government-wide site that we all contribute to. Um, there's a National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention included in there that you might want to take a look at. There's a 2016 final report. It may be of interest to you. Um, it may speak to a particular community you may be representing. Um, may have some import. The OGJDP Model Programs Guide is somewhat contained within the crime solutions, but it really is focused on, on specifically evidence-based juvenile justice and youth prevention intervention and reentry re programs and strategies. Our National Gang Center, that's OGJDP's National Gang Center, uh, it's a good resource. Uh, it also includes information on our comprehensive gang model. Um, which focuses on a lot of community-led, organizational development, social intervention uh, type activities that are very much uh, in line with uh, CBI strategies. Next slide. So uh, model standards for serving victims and survivors of crime is, is, a, is an excellent resource as well as the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit. Um, there are links embedded here. Um, there are several um, trauma links. Uh, that Sharon um, added into this, which, which uh, we appreciate, uh, some great tools for the field. Um, so do, do take a look at that um, and familiarize yourself with it. Next slide. So I would want to talk for a minute about what um, an application should include. Of course, your project narrative, uh, that includes a description of the issue, uh, your design and implementation capabilities and competencies, and your plan for collecting data. It also must include an abstract. Um, it's no more than 400 words. That is a required component that you submit that. Um, and as well as a budget worksheet and budget narrative. It's a web-based form, so it's something that's input directly into Just Grants. Um, it may be a little convoluted seeming at first, but um, I think it's pretty straightforward once you kind of dig into it. Um, next slide. Um, additional application components, I'm going to just spend a minute on that. Um, timeline uh, is one where really you should submit an attachment that has a realistic timeline with milestone charts and talks about major tasks associated with goals and objectives and, uh, you know, assigns responsibility for each and plots completion of a task by a month or quarter. Understanding this is a roadmap, this is a, this is a um, in some ways, uh, you know, this is your, your goal, right? And it could shift based on uh, if you happen to be a successful applicant and uh, you, you might hit some stumbling blocks as you come down, but put your best effort into what you think is a realistic timeline in terms of implementing your goals and objectives as uh, outlined in your response to the solicitation. Um, uh, for documentation of the subrecipients, um, indicate those clearly, the subrecipients, including the name, organizational affiliation, city and state, and any key activities that they are to, uh, to, to endeavor as part of your uh, overall pro program model. Um, and this should be submitted as an attachment in Just Grants. Um, so, you know, your team, your CBITI team should be uh, um, submitted. Um, that was outlined earlier by Sharon. Um, memorandums of understanding, letters of support, other supporting documentations. Uh, documentation should all be included. Um, if you have, uh, in terms of your capabilities and competencies, if you have, uh, you know, previous um, activities that you have uh, endeavored in terms of uh, um, past has experience in planning and team structure. You you want to enumerate that in your you know in your response as well. An organizational chart should also be included. 
Um, next slide. So a tribal authorizing resolution is, um, it may require that you include that um, as an attachment if, 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 you know, if, if you have a tribal authorizing resolution. If applicable, you will submit that document by uploading it as an attachment. Um, for research and evaluation, independence and integrity, um, if you're proposing research and or evaluation, you have to demonstrate um, its independence and integrity also to include appropriate safeguards before it could re receive award funds. Um, and that should be included as an attachment in just grants as well. Um, and all of these disclosures and assurances listed are application components that you need to address uh, lobbying activities, uh, disclosure of duplication of costs, basically saying that you're not uh, applying for any of this under any other initiatives and you're not duplicating um, any sort of effort that's already funded. Um, you know, there's standard assurances you have to sign, uh, and you know, there's links to all of this in the solicitation, but these are important components uh, regarding the, the lobbying, especially um, all of them really, and uh, making sure that uh, if you are considered a high risk grant by DO, grantee by DOJ and you're currently a grantee, there has to be a, a disclosure justification. Um, so next, uh, next slide, real quick, I just wanna talk about your basic minimum requirements. Um, so the project abstract, that's that 400 word um, document is a, is a requirement. So meaning that if you went through all this trouble and you did all these other things, um, but you failed to submit a pro proposal abstract, you would be um, removed from consideration for uh, a competitive uh, process. And so you would never get past go, if you will. It's happened. So please take the time to really um, pull together uh, concise 400 word proposal abstract included as an attachment because it's a necessary, not sufficient, but a necessary condition for you to uh, to, to be reviewed as a um, as a competitive uh, submitter for this uh, under the solicitation. The proposal narrative um, and the budget worksheet, which is that uh, web-based form that includes budget details and the budget narrative, um, as well as a timeline. Those elements are necessary for you to uh, pass go, if you will. Um, next slide. So I just want to talk for one second about the uh, the review process, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Um, uh, so so the reviewed the applications are reviewed to ensure that they meet those minimum requirements that we just talked about, those elements, the four elements, and that they're included. And uh, if, if they include those, they're moved forward to peer review. If they're not, um, they're excluded from peer review. And um, and that's not great. So I, I believe everyone on this call is going to is going to focus on those those four elements. Um, the peer review um, is a panel of three external subject matter experts that review, convene, come together, and then there's scores that are presented to um, a Bureau of Justice Assistance Program representative who provide the scoring results to the director of BJA with recommendations for funding. And then that final decision is made by BJA uh, director. Um, and um, and, and that, that's, that's, that's the process in a nutshell. There's a couple, just two last words on the next slide, and then I'm gonna turn it over. Um, so next slide. Um, okay, so the deadlines. This is probably one of the most important things um, you gotta keep track of, is that there's a dual um, reality in terms of deadlines. There's this grants.gov deadline of May 18th, where you're required to go in prior to May 18th at 8.59 p.m. Eastern time, and you have to submit an SF-424, which is that application for federal assistance. It's like a cover page. It's pretty basic information about who you are as an organization, and also it includes your lobbying disclosure form. If you fail to submit those two things as part of your grants.gov deadline, everything stops. There's no ability for you to submit a full um, application on May 25th. So I would encourage each of you to go into B to grants.gov in the next week or so, get that piece done. Because if you encounter an issue 
you'll have plenty of time to figure out how to rectify that issue. Um, you just don't want to be last minute going into that, getting locked out, and then having an inability to submit what may be a nearly complete application, but it will not be reviewed if you fail to meet the, uh, the May 18th deadline. So again, the May 18th deadline is a necessary but not sufficient condition for you to uh, be able to successfully submit. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, so keep track of those deadlines. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Curtis Cannon, my colleague in OGJDP. Thank you, Scott, and good afternoon uh, to all you for joining us today. Again, my name is Curtis Cannon. I'm a program manager with OJJDP, and I'd like to share some uh, additional application resources with you today. For more helpful information on how to apply for this opportunity, please take a look at our recorded webinar, The Federal Funding Process, First Steps to Applying, How to Prepare Now, and Other Considerations. Uh, this series is designed to help applicants find and apply for BGA funding opportunities. Uh, this webinar will provide you with information about the registrations that are necessary to apply for funding, how to navigate grants.gov and just grants, and what resources are available for applicants. Links to access these webinars are provided here on the slide. As Scott mentioned, um, your SF-424 and SF-LLLs are required components, uh, critical and required components of your application. For assistance submitting these documents, um, there's, gr there's grants.gov applicant support, and they're avail available via phone or email 24 seven, except for federal holidays. And when you reach out, um, do make sure that you include an issue, um, the issue that you're facing uh, for as supporting details when you call or email, so they know exactly how to provide support. Um, Another thing about grants.gov, you'll be able to search for available funding opportunities across federal agencies at uh, this site. Just grant support. Uh, DOJ also provides, provides user support for its justice grant systems or just grants. Uh, there's a support hotline, email, and a resource center with all kinds of helpful guides to support you. Uh, there are FAQs and training, and I encourage you to use all of these various support options listed uh, here below to assist in, in accessing and using the Just Grant system to its fullest. For general questions and information about available OJG, OJP publications, statistics, training, and technical assistance, as well as funding opportunities and our solicitations, there's also uh, the OJP Resource Center or Response Center, uh, which can be reached via email, or web chat, and phone. Um, to stay connected, you can also sign up to receive email notifications on new funding opportunities and other resources. There's a twice weekly or twice monthly Just Info newsletter and the weekly funding news email. To subscribe to these, please visit the link provided here and select Grants Funding as your area of interest. I'd also like to discuss some uh, do's and don'ts for applying. Uh, things to consider as you're pulling together your application. Use simple and concise language. Uh, the clearer, the better. Um, you never know who's going to be reviewing your application, so you want to make sure that they can track what you're proposing. Um, again, so you want to ensure that your information is presentable and organized. Add tables, graphs, staff photos, and other images uh, when possible, uh, while being mindful, again, of the grant guidelines that were discussed before. Uh, be realistic about how you will achieve the goals that you're proposing. Uh, to do this, I'd, I'd encourage you to get feedback from those who may be running the project um, to make sure these are, in fact, uh, realistic goals. Make sure the proposal is consistent with the solicitation, because, uh, again, that's what we're checking against in our review, uh, those solicitation requirements. And lastly, check, recheck, and check again your budget, grant requirements, references, and other grant details. Lastly, here are a few more ways to stay connected with us here. Um, you can sign up for Text OJP for more updates from the agency, and you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And again, for more information on funding opportunities, publications, initiatives, uh, you can always visit us at BGA's website. Um, thank you so much for your time today, and now I'd like to hand things over to my colleague, Jen Grotz-Peter. 
Thank you, Curtis. Um, on behalf of NIJ, thank you to everyone joining today's webinar. My name is Jen Grotpeter, and I am one of the NIJ social science analysts working on the CVPI, CVIPI research portfolio. Um, our solicitation is, uh, is titled NIJ Fiscal Year 23 CVIPI Research Evaluation and Associated Training and Technical Assistance Support. We already held a webinar on our solicitation last week on March 23rd. In a few minutes, we'll show you where to find information on our solicitation and on that webinar. I will note that our solicitation, like the OJP solicitation, was posted on March 7th. Ours, however, will close on June 5th, 2023, with a just, uh, in just grants, with a grant stock of deadline of May 22nd. This is intended to give applicants a little more time to prepare evaluation applications after the programmatic applications are submitted. Um, all I'll say on the next slide about the program history is that last year NIJ funded two evaluation studies of the 47 programmatic studies that were funded by OJP. And this year we anticipate making additional rigorous evaluation study awards. Um, to the next slide. Um, broadly, our solicitation um, seeks applications funding to support the conduct of and to carry out independent evaluations of CVI PI programs and to conduct rigorous research on community violence with the goal of enhancing a CVI evaluation capacity and to produce practical knowledge that can advance the prevention and reduction of violent crime in communities. On the next slide, you'll see that our solicitation includes four funding categories with different expectations and requirements to support research and evaluation complementary to and in support of the CVI PI. Category three here is most similar to last year's NIJ solicitation. Uh, applicants may apply for NIJ funding consideration under multiple categories, but if an applicant, applicant intends to submit multiple uh, proposals to multiple categories, each proposal should be submitted in a separate application and must specify which category is applicable on the cover page. And as Tenzing mentioned earlier, also if you're submitting paired applications, for um, a program site and an evaluation partner for category three this year, please clearly indicate on the cover page which application program you're applying to evaluate. And on our final slide, for much more detailed information on all four of our funding categories, please find on this slide a link to the NIJ solicitation. It includes frequently asked questions, which includes a list of those OJP funded sites that were awarded last year and are eligible for evaluation under this year's solicitation. Slides and transcripts from our webinar will be posted soon on that page. And I will now turn the program back over to Daryl to begin the Q&A. Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks to all of our presenters today. What I wanted to highlight here before we conclude for today is just a quick reference guide that you can use to contact uh, once we conclude today for any support, whether it's grants.gov, contact them at support at grants.gov, just grants, just grants.support at uscdoj.gov, or OJP Response Center for any programmatic requirements or questions about the solicitation itself at grants at ncgrs.gov. And I'll pass it to Tenzing. Tenzing, did you want to address any uh, Q at this point or? Sure. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. So we got a lot of questions, and I don't think we will get through all the questions, uh, but we will be responding to the questions that came in today. Uh, we will take a couple of questions now, like uh, questions that we are seeing asked a lot. So the first question is, can applicants be eligible to apply if they have uh, recently been funded as, uh, you know, as a lead or like were awarded a CBPI grant or like uh, any other grant also? So Kathy? Yeah, so you can uh, apply for an, uh, a grant this time, if you already have another award, just make sure that these, uh, the activities on these are discrete from each other. And the other question was, can you apply for funding under more than one category? Yes, that is also possible. You could, you could apply to like a category one and a category four. Again, just making sure that, you know, you're being responsive to uh, all parts of each one of those and not overlapping in uh, time commitment. Um, 
Um, and the next question is, if a county agency has already completed a planning process, how will, uh, how will the required nine month planning phase impact us? Will we have to redo planning efforts, violence assessment, and et cetera, or we can uh, grant these funds to be more heavily on implementation based on planning work already done? Yeah, that's a great question. So no, you do not have to redo your planning. Um, it's a time to, uh, if you've got any additional planning to do with, on that or, or build on, on that work, um, then you may do that. You do not have to take the whole nine months. It's sort of an up to nine months. It's sort of a ballpark there of that time. So uh, hope that answers that. Uh, Kathy, do we have uh, more time for more questions or? Um, I think we're getting a little uh, tight on time since we've gone over. What I will recommend is, because uh, we had a lot going on in the Q&A and in the chat, so, um, uh, and I think we, we answered quite a few of them uh, in Q&A, but we will compile all of these and send out a, a frequently asked questions, also something that we'll post. Uh, I think we'll be able to post that on our, our website. Um, and then, but if there are any questions that we did not answer, or we don't answer to the FAQ, uh, please feel free to contact um, the help uh, desk that we've uh, pointed to here. So Daryl, I think uh, that's about it for now. Is there anything else before we close? No, just to, to reiterate what you mentioned, everybody on today's call will receive an email once the deliverables are posted to the BGA website, and that will include that additional FAQ file that, that uh, Kathy did mention. So be on the lookout for that. So on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our panelists, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. This will end today's presentation.